Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to the Main, uh, Main Street Homeowners Association. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to introduce myself and share why I'm, why I'm a candidate for mayor of our city, or the city of Tuskegee. Uh, I'm a native son of Tuskegee. I was born and reared in Tuskegee, have lived in Tuskegee all my life, uh, attended the public schools in Macon County and graduated the public schools and uh, attended the university and eventually graduated from Faulkner University with a uh, BS degree in business administration with a minor in business management and I'm a magna cum laude graduate. Uh, my background is basically um, a business person and have been a business person let me say this, I'm a salesperson slash business person. <laughs> I think that's important and you'll know more why that's important as a candidate for mayor um, a little down the road. But I uh, started off as a core salesperson while in college and then eventually opened uh, my own car business in Tuskegee, Alabama in 1991. And since 1991, we've operated uh, three multiple locations of automobile business in the pre-owned and uh, Chevrolet Oldsmobile franchise in Tallahassee, Alabama. Uh, my background is also um, construction. Uh, my brother and I have operated a um, construction company for about 15 years and we do federal work for the federal government. After working with my brother's company for about 15 years, I've started my own company in Tuskegee in 2017 to continue doing work for the federal government. And that's mostly construction, all types of construction um, work. And we previously did a lot of environmental type work, asbestos lead and mold abatement. But um, I wanted to do something a little different. So I kind of ventured off on my own to do construction and site work and some architectural design work. Um, I have served on the Tuskegee City Council from 1996 to 2000. I served as the city's planning commission chairman from 2002 until 2016. I've served on the board of directors as a secretary for the Tuskegee Area Chamber of Commerce from 1996 up into 2011. So um, that's about 15 years on the board of directors for the Chamber of Commerce. And I am a U.S. Army veteran and an Eagle Scout. So that's, that's a little bit about my background information. And now I'd like to kind of share with you uh, why, why I'm a candidate for mayor in the city of Tuskegee. I'm a candidate for mayor because um, I have observed how our city has declined over the past few years. I have a substantial investment in our community. There are certain things that have transpired more recently that have just me. Um, and I just don't feel that government is addressing the issues that's having our community. So, hold a second, Harvey. Why don't you turn the other computer on getting feedback? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. So, so my first priority and my number one item for my platform is the 911 system in the city of Tuskegee. And it appears that a lot of people are aware of the problem, but they're not trying to solve the problem and not sure, and I'm, I'm certainly hopeful that none of you have had to try to use 911 from your cell phone, but, um, and, I, and I hate to, and, I, and I'm, I'm sorry that I'm the one to share with you if you were not aware, but if you happen to need 911 and you dial from your cell phone, you probably, you may or may not get an answer. And it's a problem that um, <clears throat> I've had more of my share of experiences various um, times trying to dial 911 and it's been an issue. And so uh, 911, I have made it the number one platform issue for me as a candidate for mayor. 
Um, the number two item is coincides with 911 and is an urgent healthcare facility in Tuskegee. Um, I don't think that we're large enough to support a hospital, but an urgent care facility that's open after five o'clock and an urgent care facility that will address if a citizen should have a major medical problem like a heart attack, um, stroke, diabetic shock, um, gunshot, stab wounds, be stabilized and then transported to a hospital of a family's choice. Um, the next my next item is repair and pave the street. The street. And the number four is to enhance the beautification of our city. Um, and I'll start with the one on, just, just on Main, let's just start with Main Street. Homeowners Association. There's a home on Main Street that has been burned out probably for seven or eight years and the city has not enforced the abatement ordinance to have that home torn down on Main Street. And it's the gateway entering our city coming from Union Springs, Alabama. And although we'd like to beautify the entire city, my focus will be on the four main entrances entering and exiting our city, you know, should be the, um, the highlighted areas of what our community represents those main entrances and that's what people see when they don't stop but they're just passing through and travelers and it just those are the welcoming mats of our city and i just think they should be as beautiful like, as they can be on a daily basis that uh, trash and garbage is put out on the side of the road on the main thoroughfares they should be checked daily where there's not debris on the side of the road for several days of the week um, I'd like to increase the um, relationship with businesses that the city of Tuskegee has. There's not a good business relationship with businesses that are in Tuskegee and businesses that um, come here on a part-time basis to do business in the city. We're not, we don't have a business friendly environment currently from city government. Another goal of mine is to build the, build a Head Start facility. Um, appropriations were appropriated in 2009 to build a $2.1 million head start. The federal government, uh, Department of um, Health and Human Services appropriated $2.1 million for the city. The Head Start purchased the funds, uh, purchased a property, uh, which is at the corner of Taylor Street and Franklin Road. They purchased a property from Tuskegee University. They, the site work was done for the property. A sign was erected that the building would be completed August of 2010. And today, there's no building for the Head Start. So in short, um, I plan to be a mayor for the entire city. I plan to be a mayor that addresses needs and concerns from our Head Start children to our eldest citizen, which is my understanding is 100 years of age. If there's someone older, I'm not aware. But my information tells me that our eldest citizen in the city is 100 years old. And I plan to have social recreation programs for youth from age three to that 100 year old citizen in the Maryland subdivision. And uh, that's, the, that, that's in short, I think. And one other item, uh, two other items. One, I would like to recruit a community bank to Tuskegee. And, uh, finally, I would like to implement a, a two other items, a 311 phone number so that citizens can have a phone number to call um, without having to speak to a live person. They can leave their con complaints, their concerns, or their compliments to city government, which would be a 311 phone number where they can do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And um, I'd like to support the local school system from city government. There's not much cooperation between city government and the local school system currently. And um, I think that's the gist of what um, my platform is all about. And I'll answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chappelle, for that overview. Does anybody have 
Any questions? This is Herbert. I have a question. Uh, thank you for that introduction and explanation of the platform, but a lot of things you just described uh, requires money. And without money, you, you're going to be limited. So my question is, how do you expect to raise funds for this? So, and what are your plans for bringing in this Tuskegee? We already have a sales tax level of cents of, which means you're raising tax, of course, I have a question. So how, how do you expect to bring in money to bring this to Tuskegee? Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Maddox, for that question. And I personally don't think, and I have the finances, I don't think that the city has a financial problem as much as we have a priority problem and a mismanagement problem. The city, when I served on the city council 20 years ago, the city's budget was $6 million. The budget today is $9.2 million for the city and a $2.4 million for Head Start. And the budget for the utility system is $24 million. So the total current operation of monies that the city has is $35 million. For a community with 8,400 citizens, I think $35 million, if it was prioritized and managed properly, most communities outside don't have access to $35 million, and that doesn't include any potential grant writing for projects for our city. Um, and you're correct. Our current sales tax rate is 11.5% sales tax. And um, I will do all I can to try to work and collaborate with the school board and county government to come up with solutions to solve problems without high, having the highest sales tax in the state of Alabama. So that's one item that discourages businesses from wanting to locate um, in the city. But um, I've already talked to several businesses. I think if Tuskegee had a business person at the helm of city government that understood business and business people and how we think, I think we'll bring businesses. But we have to do some things as a city and we have to do things as a community. We have to clean up the community because I think it's, you know, really kind of silly for us to say that, you know, we want someone to come and invest $5 million, $3 million, or really $100,000 in a city that it appears from other people that have uh, visited our community before, we don't care about our own community because we won't cut the grass, we won't pick up the paper, uh, we won't pave the streets, we won't fix the potholes like they should be fixed. Uh, so we have to show business people that we care about ourselves and we're making an investment in our community and then it will encourage other people to invest um, in us. And that's the part of me being a salesperson. I think I can sell Tuskegee because we have a lot of assets and we could be a great little city. Um, and I'm a pretty good salesperson, I can sell it, but it's very difficult to sell the community when it looks abandoned as if no one cares about it. Um, I, I have we a have question. five minutes. Uh, no, you ask your question quickly, please. Okay. Uh, you know, one of the things I always thought was missing here, we don't have any kind of developments coming to this town. You know, most people have developments that look at it and come. Yeah. Are you able to maybe bring some developers in? Do you know any developers that might want to do something in our town? I, I, I have relationships with several developers. I've already talked to several of them. But one of the things you have to do with this, and our city as former chairman of the planning commission and as a business person, uh, you have to have, you know, I went in business when I was, you know, 25, 24 years old, and I had a business plan. The city does not have a business plan. They don't have a business person. They don't have a person at all that's recruiting business. They depend strictly on the Macon County Economic Development Authority to do all of the business recruiting for the entire county. Well, it's good to be a part of that organization because the city has an appointment to that board. But when the person comes and the industry comes, this is, this is what happened with the Economic Development Authority. That person, Joe Turnham, shows the developer the entire county. And then that developer decides 
which location in the county he chooses to represent. Well, no the city is able to show why the person should be in Tuskegee versus Shorter, Tuskegee versus Nodal Selgo, or Tuskegee versus Franklin. So for one, the Tuskegee has an industrial development board that I don't think no one has been appointed to it in the past eight years. The font board. So I see our own person trying to sell the city, the industrial development board, along with a person like me as mayor to sell the city. Thank you. If I can ask one last quick question, please. Um, Mr. Chappell, were you aware that the EMS 911 system, as well as the uh, community health care and emergency system, are as a rule administered by the county and not by the city? Y yes, ma'am. But, uh, and I have contacted members of the E911 board. I've contacted, you know, ever since I learned of the problem um, for at least a year now. I've been making contact with the E911 board members to with the um, EMA director, Mr. Frank Lee. They are aware of the problem. And um, so I just feel that I need to use the power and the position of the mayor to, because they're not listening to me as a citizen or as a business owner. Um, I've had a member at my church to die as a result of the 911 not operating properly. Um, we had a, you know, I've just been on the end of 911 and many other citizens and law enforcement, they are aware of the problem, but they're just not taking it serious enough to, um, to address it. And as mayor, I think that by the office of the mayor, it would be able to put more pressure on whomever to get the 911 system fixed. Yes, it's a county problem, mm -hmm. but still on Main Street. So, uh, when you need 911, I don't think you're going to be worried about whether it's a state problem or a county problem. It's a Main Street problem when you dial 911 and no one answers the phone. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, I want to thank Mr. Chappelle for his time. If someone wants to contact you, will you give us the authority to share your email address with that person. absolutely email or my phone number my phone number is <clears throat> and my campaign is 1707 pothole and you can dial me at that number because uh, pothole is a big issue in street paving um and you know like i said the city the city, the city let me say this regarding potholes real quickly the city receives from each gallon of gasoline that each of us purchases in the city of Tuskegee. there's a four cent gasoline tax a seven cent gasoline tax. There's a capital improvement tax that comes to the city of Tuskegee monthly from the state of Alabama. The only thing that you can do by law, only expense you can expend with that money by state law, Code of Alabama 1975, is paving and resurfacing streets. And it's difficult for me for the city to receive $250,000 per year for street paving, but the only budget in their budget to spend $50,000 a year. Well, that's that's certainly something for us to chew on. We thank you again for your time and hope you have a great evening. Yes, ma'am. Thank you all. Thanks, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. And don't forget, uh, vote Roselle Chappelle for mayor. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. God bless you all. Have a good evening. Okay. We have there you go. Hey, right on time. Hey, good. Joining us at exactly 525. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Can you, can't hear you. Unmute yourself. Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, okay. There you go. So uh, as with the other candidate, we're going to give you five minutes or so for kind of an introductory presentation. Sure. And then ask that you uh, allow the group to ask you a few questions after your initial remarks. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, most of the people here you already know, so. Right, I don't know Tuskegee University. I think that's Sarah Stringer, but I'm not, I'm not sure, but I think that's Sarah Stringer. <laughs> okay. So All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, 
to talk to you briefly about our city and uh, what we're doing in Tuskegee and what we plan to do and talk about uh, my bid for re-election as mayor of the city of Tuskegee. So uh, first, I'd like to say I want to thank you and thank you for the opportunity to serve. I think it's very important as we move forward because as Sylvester McPherson, who we call the communicator, and I was saying the other day on the radio, Tuskegee is actually a great place to live if you take advantage of it. So many people talk about it but don't realize the opportunities that we have here, especially if we're working together and building on those opportunities. We're not going to be in Atlanta. We're not going to be in Montgomery or Auburn or even Pike Grove, but we can be a great Tuskegee, pattern after some of those successful cities if we so choose. So coming into office, we began working on revitalization. We tried to create new energy, new interests, which has led to new investment in our community. We entered the office with uh, numerous challenges, financial challenges, non-functional equipment, facilities in need of repairs, personnel and legal matters that we had to address. But we worked and put together an administrative team that's been able to address those concerns and get them under control. We developed a good administrative team and found some allies on the Tuskegee City Council that had the same views and ideas about progress and improvements that needed to be made. We reached out to Tuskegee University, to the president, to the board of trustees, the alumni, faculty and staff, and especially the students to reopen the lines of communication and build a trusted relationship between the town and gown for our mutual benefit. We established direct communication with key government officials from the national level in Washington to the state level, all the way down to the local level. From Senator Doug Jones, Senator Shelby, Governor Ivey, Congressman Mike Rogers, and even Congresswoman Sewell, who's not even in our district, but she has a real concern about Tuskegee and Macon County and especially Tuskegee University. We've reached out to them because they're the people who are helping us to get access to resources, financial and otherwise, to help our community. In the ambulance crisis, Tuskegee, the city of Tuskegee stepped up to save the ambulance service and to support Macon County and ensure and significantly improve our ambulance service. We've life flighted a number of people out of this community. I mean, numerous people have had to go out of here on a helicopter, and primarily because they realized they wouldn't make it to Montgomery within 30 minutes because of traffic. So they'll bring the helicopters in, in any time that's needed, and that's because we set up a great arrangement for that. We replaced the old equipment with new fire trucks, a new pumper truck, new ladder truck, and a new um, brush truck. We have new police cars that we replaced, several new police cars, a shiny, shiny new knuckle bone truck, like Judge Judy said, <laughs> and a shiny, shiny new red garbage truck that you'll see going around with what we have done recently. And then working with the Macon County Economic Development Authority and the Tuskegee Area Chamber of Commerce we created a business-friendly environment, and that helped us to be a finalist in the T100 competition, competing against over 143 cities for one of the largest military contracts in the last 10 years. That put us in a great position to show what we can do when we come together. Also, with this business-friendly environment, we helped to develop Exit 38. We also witnessed the opening of new smaller businesses in our community, such as Vaughn's Tarver Meat Store, C&K Wings, City Gear down in Washington Plaza, um, Saladin Walker's Laundromat down at the end of North Main Street and other smaller businesses. We are very pleased about that and particularly excited about the work that was done at Exit 38 and the marable uh, investment of $7 million plus from his family, a local person building a travel center there at Exit 38. And we were happy to be part of that working with the Economic Development Authority, Utilities Board and the city working together in private investment. Working with the Federal Aviation Agency, FAA, we recently uh, developed a new terminal out at the airport, which would be the Herbert E. Carter Terminal Building. First time we've had a terminal out there. Herbert E. Carter was a former resident of Tuskegee. He was a former employee of Tuskegee University and a former Tuskegee Airman. And his wife was also a pilot, one of the first pilots, female pilots in the state of Alabama. We also did redevelop three apartments in Tuskegee. For over 20 years, we didn't have any development of apartments. Washington Chapel, Chapel, Washington Chapel Apartments were redeveloped, College Court was redeveloped, and now they're working on Capricorn. So we've had some major things that have happened. We haven't done everything we wanted to do, 
because of the challenges we had. We still have a lot to do in recreation, a lot to do around the lake, and a lot to do in terms of street repair and paving. But one of the things that I can say, and I'm very pleased to share, is that because of our improved financial condition, those are some of the things we'll be addressing very, very soon. We turned around our financial condition from where we came in the office with over $500,000 in accounts payable alone and other challenges. We couldn't borrow from anybody. And we've had people coming to us offering to provide resources for some of the projects that we want to carry out. So coming in, we were expecting population decline. We now have renewed interest and are looking for population increase. Coming in, we face disinvestment. We now have renewed interest and demonstrated investments in this community. Coming in, we faced a lot of doubts and concern about our direction of our community. Now, along with our partners, we're planning for a bright future in Tuskegee. So I ask you to join us today. Join our team. Hashtag 2020 vision for Tuskegee's future, a bright future and a brighter future for us all. I thank you. I ask for your vote and support on August 25th to reelect Lawrence Tony Haygood, Mayor of the City of Tuskegee. And let's continue the progress moving forward. We've demonstrated our progress and if you'd like, I'll tell you about my experience where I serve on different committees throughout the state because of the, uh, them seeing the progress we made here in Tuskegee and the confidence they have in us and our leadership. I was one of the 10 mayors selected to decide how to develop and divide the resources that came from the COVID-19 uh, stimulus fund. It's only 10 mayors out of 43 that were selected for that process. I serve as chairman of the Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources Committee for the Alabama League of Municipalities. I work with the executive committee of the Alabama League of Municipalities. I serve on the Governor's Workforce Development State Board uh, selection there, and I serve on the Elm Fund Board, which is the financial board of Alab Alabama League of Municipalities. So I think we have demonstrated that there's new confidence in doing business in Tuskegee and working with us in our plan. And we just today met with some people on a potential new business to come to this community and some others who are looking at coming in. We had three meetings today, three different times that I was in and out of here from Montgomery to Tallis to back to Tuskegee. So we're working constantly to build this community. And I think it's a great opportunity to continue that forward progress. So I ask for your voting support to continue our forward progress and continue to move in here in Tuskegee, despite the obstacles and challenges. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Let me, let me ask about um, a concern was expressed, and I understand that, but I now know much more about the issue than I did three years ago. Would you discuss, just for the education of everyone here, something about the abatement process and what is what you have to go through in order to get rid of decrepit and falling down properties? Okay, the abat abatement process generally takes about five steps, as, I, as I've broken it down to five steps. You have identification of a property that needs to be abated, you then send out letters and give notification to people that needs to be done. And then on the third step, you bring it to the city council to actually abate it, which means the council is given notification and the city council is taking action to say this property can be abated. Well, what never happened was the fourth and fifth step under the previous administration. The fourth step is you implement the abatement. And the fifth step, once you implement it, you turn it over to the attorney to file a lien where the city can then take it over, fix it, uh, through the city or make it available to some other potential property owner investor. Fourth and fifth steps never happen. We have about 300 abated properties that have been through the whole process and come through the council, but you can't do anything until you do the fourth step, which is implement the abatement, takes those last two steps, and then turn it over to the, the uh, attorney to take a tax, I mean, an abatement lien on the property so that the city can take possession. If we don't do that, we haven't taken the legal step. We are now beginning to do that because we brought on another person just to deal with that uh, area in community development where there was a void. So in addition to doing that, that's one of our major challenges. The work with the city manager Owens, we're focusing on abatement at this time. Mr. Mayor, we have taken down six properties, six to eight properties already that we were already ahead on. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. I apologize. Um, you mentioned being on a, a task force or some group to decide on distribution of COVID-19 funds? Yes, did, that's the stimulus. Did Tuskegee receive any of those federal dollars? We will receive, Macon County will receive over a million dollars. Did yeah. Will? So, okay. Macon County will receive over a million dollars. What's yeah. Tuskegee's portion? We don't know. We got to work with the county. We're trying to work out the final details now. They were trying to make it based on the city size or population 
or some other factors, and we're still working on that because the task force is still working on it now. But we found, remember when the governor fought the legislature that was trying to take the money? Yeah. Or something like, originally they were going to split up uh, $740 million with all the cities. Then it, the governor and others took out so much, the legislature wanted a big chunk. Well, it came down to $250 million. So out of $250 million, they sent it to county. So Macon County, Tuskegee got a million dollars. It's a million for a million seven, I think it was. Are so there we got to work on that on now. What, That's the next step. Are there restrictions on what recipient governments can do with the funds? Uh, not a lot of restrictions. All we had to do was prove that we had some losses and we can use a way we need to make up for any loss in uh, operational entity of the government itself. Did we experience losses? We experienced some losses, yes, and money we had to spend out during this time. See, we would have money coming in from the activity at the university. There was some reduction of activity at the university. Uh, the students not being here had reduction in activities in other areas. And so because we experienced some losses and we continue to employees, and we have to make up for that money we expended out. So we did get a separate uh, $20,000 that I signed for a little over a week ago from the FAA, which was divided up among all airports based on your size. And we just had to fill out proper paperwork and apply for that. So we have been approved for that $20,000, which was separate. And that goes, that's restricted to the airport. We had to do something at the airport for that. Yeah, you know, I have a question speaking of the airport. Yeah, we opened up that, uh, that uh, what do you think, the Eugene Carter? Terminal building? Terminal building yet? We've taken it over. We haven't opened it up yet because we've got to buy furniture. But we've taken it over. We've gone through the final step. Unfortunately, we had um, some flooding in there last week that we got straightened out. Um, but we're ready to open. The only thing that we're waiting on is a date that we can uh, call together a dedication. And we're holding back because of COVID-19. So we're hoping to do that sometime in July. Uh, but it's ready to go. And we're ready to dedicate. We want to have a big activity around it because that's Colonel Carter. That's a Tuskegee Airman. We have red tails that want to fly in here. We have a lot of people who've asked about participating in Carter's family, but we are, you know, looking for a date. Like most things, COVID-19 has most things on hold. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, I mean, we're ready to go. We get to, we're working on the furniture now. Okay. Now, I know I got a whole bunch of questions. I'm not going to answer them. But the, my, my pet peeve is, you know this, has always been downtown Tuskegee. Yes. Uh, are there any plans on the book to do something about our downtown right now. Talk with a gentleman this morning, that's why I was this morning in the rain, talking with some people who helped develop downtown Montgomery. They also did a plan for Wetumpkin. So they're gonna come down and uh, they've offered to take a look at the downtown and see what we need to do. We also will be following up with uh, Main Street, Alabama, right before the COVID-19 came in. Uh, Mr. Owens agreed to get us up to speed with uh, Main Street. Because you know, when you go to second level, we were already at the first level where you sign on to become a member second level where you pay a little more money and then they come in and start giving you assistance. So now we're looking to go to the second level, which will help us to develop the downtown. Now I've had some people who've expressed that they had money and interest in doing it. So we'll see where they come through. But our plan is to put together a plan with Main Street and some uh, architects from Montgomery to really take a look at the whole downtown and see how we can develop it. We're actually gonna be revisiting our city plan, our entire city plan. And we'll be planning that with the university because if we plan it with the university, we get the most bang out of the buck for the university, the county, and the city working together. We can develop a plan independently, but we're so interjoined in what we do. We need to do that together with the Macon County Economic Development Authority, the city, the county, all parties together in planning, all the parties. Will there be public hearings as part of that process? Oh, yes. Public citizens public know. Hearings. Yes, public, there'll be public hearings. I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to know how citizens can be engaged in that process. Oh, yes. After we set up the general agreement about how we're going to approach it, it it's always um, yeah, a main part of it to have citizens' involvement and input. Because citizens have ideas of what they think should happen, as Noah was saying. Um, they'll decide what kind of tourism do we want to have? What do we want our downtown to look like? So we then take the plan and see what's feasible, what's recommended for what's been done in other communities, what's unique to our community, and then if we have the resources to do it and we try to execute it on that basis. But citizen input is a key part of developing our, our future plan. Um, Mr. Mayor, we had a little bit of commotion downtown today. Um, yeah. And from what I've heard, I 
hate to pass rumors, but I wasn't out there to get direct firsthand information. Uh, the sanitation workers complained that they did not get and don't have masks. Is that true? No, that's not true. We, they have had masks. As a matter of fact, the funny thing about it was I had a citizen call me last week complaining because the sanitation workers weren't wearing their masks. And I said, they have masks. And I told them, I was just coming downtown when they called me. I said, I just passed some and they had on masks. But when I came downtown, I saw others who didn't have one. Not today. This was last week. And they've been given masks. Mr. Owens ordered a ton of masks through um, the um, HR department uh, last week. We were given some additional masks by Alpha Phi Fraternity and one other organization. So we have masks available. Now they may not wear them, they may not change that, change them out. But you got to remember this is a political season. We're down to three months coming up on the election, and things start to happen without ex explanation. You complain about something, but you haven't talked to the city manager. You haven't talked to the human resources person. You haven't talked to the mayor. Haven't talked to the city single city single city council person. So how do you have a grievance and you haven't talked to anybody? And then is it valid? We have provided them with masks, but see nobody's asking them the questions. Where do you say you haven't had masks? And uh, the, everybody from the clerk down to human resources can tell you and show you. I've got some right here in my office that were donated. So we had plenty of masks, and they were the first ones given masks. It's a political season. If you notice who else was downtown and who they worked for, you'll understand that you're going to have a lot of this going on because there's some people who are intent on not having this administration be reelected. No administration in the last 20 years has been reelected. It's by design. If we don't get continuity in Tuskegee, we'll keep going back and back again. We're moving forward right now, making progress, and we're intent on making that progress. I may not please everybody. This council may not please everybody. But it's not many people say that, that can say that we haven't worked with them or tried to hear them or tried to work on solutions better for Tuskegee. It may not be better for some individuals or some firms who want to control, but you know, it's not about that. I'm going to try to do the best I can for everybody here, inclusively, and particularly for this community. And there are some people who want to take that away. I've been given offers. That's no secret. I've been told. You can get this or you can get that. I'm not interested in this or that. I'm interested in what's best for this city as a whole. Because I've been here, and I know why we haven't gotten somewhere as a key or fifth person in Montgomery asked me today, I don't understand why Tuskegee doesn't progress with all it has. He said, it is a jewel, and all the Tuskegee has, you really thought it would have expanded much further by now and progress. Well, when you look at the challenges of people being divided in this community, and that division is just showing itself again because it's election time. So we said, as, we, as I said in response to MT today, they're welcome to come to any of us and talk. We are open. The human resources person went out to see what their gripe was. They said, we'll get back with you. Uh, we've been advised not to say anything. We're advising you. The same people who led the protest the last time, it lasted two days and wasn't about a whole lot. And you had some former legal people in there. So we got to understand the dynamics of this community. Unfortunately, I think it's a political situation. Because if you don't ask me anything, how can I respond? If you don't ask the city manager, how can he respond? If you don't talk to the human resources person, how can she respond? Then you say something that's not true, and that's what the city manager was upset about. He said, how are they going to get up and not tell the truth? He said, that's not a true at all. We've given them masks. Given them masks, gloves. This group of workers has had more equipment than any group of workers that ever worked in, in the public works department. They got raincoats. They got green coats. They have gloves. We went through that months ago with attorney Milton Davis, who reminded us to make sure they had everything they needed. So it's just a situation that's unfortunate. And I expect to see more of that. You're going to have creative situations. And for me, that's a creative situation. If you have something, then bring it to an official where we can respond and assist you. If you just want to create a situation, anyone can do that. Some Is there a is there a grievance process? Do the employees know? They, yes, do they, they know. Just... And then several of those people out there were temp. There's, and if you look at, okay, your grievance is not on Facebook. Understand that. And those who <laughs> on Facebook all the time. And those who was the first person out there interviewing people on Facebook. There is a concerted effort. If they were really serious and had a challenge, they would have come to us. And we haven't heard from any of them. Not the human resources person, not the city manager, not the mayor, not any city council person. If they want anything else, they come to us. So, I, you know, 
I can only say we, we're here to work with them if they're sincere. But we're not here to play games and play political politics. The city has to continue to function. And that's what we're going to do the best we can to keep it going. But we expect this. This is what happens in the cycle of politics in Tuskegee Macon County, unfortunately. And what we're trying to do is move ahead as we're doing now. Any final questions for Mr. Hager? Are we allowed to talk about one thing that I find really exciting that the Planning Commission just found out about? Sure. Are we? Yes. Okay. Um, our mayor, in conjunction with other cities officials and the UBT, have been working with a um, planning uh, firm, a commercial firm, and I've learned a lot in the last three years that I didn't know about city government before. But one of it is that people will try to get past the planning commission to build any old thing any old way. And um, as an aside, Noah, I, you wouldn't believe the number of times that the planning commission has had to block things that were truly, truly harebrained schemes because people thought we were so desperate for development in Tuskegee that we would take anything. Um, however, just this past Tuesday, we were presented with a plan that the mayor has already been working on with the UBT and with this um, company who actually knows what they're doing because the proposal we got was just amazing for a mixed use community and these kinds of things involve different densities of housing, some small shops, things like that. This particular one is on property that has been purchased already by the UBT out near the high school. And the reason I bring it up now, it is still in the planning stages, but I have learned that these kinds of things take a long time to develop. And the city officials have to have a lot of patience, a lot of persistence, um, a lot of integrity to be constantly working with these other agencies and letting them know, oh, this looks like a lovely plan, but this will not work for Tuskegee. This will not work for that particular property. We need to make some adjustments. And um, if things continue to go as they are going, we may, may very well see a very, very nice mixed use neighborhood out there uh, right next door to the high school at the end of Pleasant Springs Drive. Um, and that, that's pretty exciting because, again, these are the things that don't just pop up overnight, but they've been working on. How long ago did UBT buy that? Two years, uh, three years ago. Two to three years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So things are happening, and there's a certain level of patience perhaps involved, but I, I have had the benefit of finding out about that, and we're kind of excited about that. Well, and following up on that, that's why today I met with some key developers and architects to give us an idea of what can be done. In addition to that, I met with one of the top people who developed East Chase, the top attorney out there who's a developer, to get his advice on how to proceed so that we don't get snookered or taken advantage yeah. of. Right. Because remember, we've lost 2,000 acres out there on 199. That was the city's property. It's still in the city limits, but the city used to own it. And we lost that. We protected the city by not losing the commerce park when we had 77 acres that they wanted to use for a uh, solar farm. But we had a vertical clause and a strong clause that said, if you don't develop it, it comes back to us. So a lot of what we do is also protecting the city. And it takes time to work through those things to, to get to where you want to move forward. So we're excited because we, we, we see the forward progress. And I think it's going to show with other people as well. The university is working closely with us. And I think if we can continue to do that, we're going to see our community block. Well, Mr. Mayor, we want to thank you for your insights, your information, and um, joining us this evening. I'm sure that I'm sure we'll have to talk to you many more times before okay. the election. So um, again, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you we're so much ask... for this opportunity, and uh, we ask that you. If you feel so moved that you join us and give us suggestions about what can be done. We'll try to address anything we can. And uh, we expect some outiness to come forward during this time, but we're going to try to work with it as, remain as positive as possible because it's, it's key that we keep moving forward and keep making progress. Okay, we thank you. We ask that you sign off as we uh, 
in, as we welcome our last and final candidate. So again, we thank you. Will do. Thank you. Uh, Have a great evening. Take my dog with you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we are going to admit Jamel McDade. Uh, Jamel, are you? Did you hear? I don't. Yeah. Jamel. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing today? We're uh, we're great. Thank you for asking. We want to thank you for joining us this evening and for enlightening us about your campaign, your platform, any issues you need for us to be aware of. And I'm going to ask you to do about a five minute introductory presentation and then open the floor to questions from uh, those of us who want to ask you anything. So, okay. okay, well, I'd like to thank you all for allowing me to speak this evening. And let me introduce myself for those of you who may not know who I am. My name is Jamil McDade and I am a native of the Tuskegee area. And my family has, uh, they have deep ties in the community. And my parents are Amelia and Morris Taylor. They've been here practically all of their lives. Uh, a little bit about myself. I uh, graduated from Booker T. Washington High School. And from that point, I attended South University in Montgomery and received an associate degree in paralegal studies. And later on, I attended Faulkner University and I received my bachelor's of business and my master's in management from Faulkner University. And after I did that, I moved to Atlanta for a little while and worked in magistrate court and decided that I wanted a change out of the court system and moved back to Alabama, still remained in the court system until I just decided to branch off into a different arena, more over into the business sector. And now I work for a biopharmaceutical facility in Auburn by the name of SIO2 Medical Science. And at that facility, I am the trainer coordinator and I am over process controls and documentation. And we are actually right now working on a major pro uh, project in regards to the COVID-19 because we, in fact, manufacture vials and syringes for the medical industry. So that's a little bit about my background, my educational background as well. It's really, it's, it's really short and really brief and, and, and to the point. Can you tell us a little bit about your platform? Um, my platform is for the people, having a government for the people, because I believe in being an advocate and a voice for the people and think that we need to have someone that is going to speak for us and make sure that they put our interests in, in the forefront. Okay. Uh, uh, we're at home. Forgive us for any... Put the dog out here. Okay, okay, I'm so I'm I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, I was a little bit distracted. I decided to move back here because I felt like that it was time for Tuskegee to have a change. This will always be home to me, and I feel like I want to enjoy home and have a better quality of life and also experience those quality of life things that I hear the people in the community always talk about, our elders always talk about the golden days, and those things were pretty much gone by the time I came around and of age in order to enjoy those things. So I want to be able to bring that back here. I want uh, our people to have a better quality of life. I want, to, want them to be able to feel safe in their homes. I want them to be able to have cleaner and safer streets, um, also cleaner and safer communities. Uh, we need better work opportunities and better pay. We need responsiveness and visibility of our local leadership. So there are so many things that concern me that I felt that now would be the great a great time to just put my, um, put my head in the ring and take my best shot because I feel that the community needs it. So 
what's, do you have any, any governmental or any governmental experience or any experience working um, in anything like government? I am not a politician. I am a business owner and I have a business background. And the city of Tuskegee, although it is a governmenting body, it is also a business. And you have to have proper processes and systems in place in order for your business to function properly. And I feel with my business background, my internal auditing experience, my leadership and workshop development experience, my accounting and tax preparation experience, as well as my economic development certification and training and experience that I will be able to bring that to the community. So can I ask you a question, the same question I asked the other two. Mm -hmm. Number one, two, my, my pet peeve is downtown. Mm -hmm. And so and do you have any kind of plans in mind or how you can bring our downtown back and now you are you familiar with any developers that might you might be able to bring it here because since I've been that's one of the things that we've been lacking is having developers to have interest in our community. Do you have any of that? I do in fact have a plan um, for the downtown revitalization area. Um, actually in my journey and researching and studying this area for a long time before I moved back, I connected with some people in regards to Main Street and other areas to kind of help out with some ideas. I've also been working with some developers as well, but we have to take care of our blighted properties down there. So we have to look at the, uh, the property owners that own those pieces of property to see, can we work with them in order to get those properties back in productive use? Because they have the historical characteristics. So there are a lot of things that we can't touch, about, uh, touch on those but we can enhance them and make them business ready, but that's gonna take us creating some type of task force or a transitional team that will be able to work together to create a viable plan with sites and everything, catalog and everything to be able to present to the governmental body as well as the public, the direction that we would wanna go with our downtown instead of just making a decision for what I want downtown to be we need people in the community to make suggestions of what they want to see in the downtown area as well. So, so that's your plan is to bring other people in to try to plan? Not entirely. <clears throat> the plan is to be able to create a transitional volunteer team. I have my own plan, but I don't want it to necessarily be about what Jamil wants it's always good to work hand in hand with people in the community because what Jamil wants may not necessarily be what, uh, be what the people in the community want. So we need to be able to hear everybody out to be able to formulate a viable plan that works for everyone in the community because here again, we are having to cater to the youth and we're also having to cater to our elders. So we wanna make sure it's an intergenerational type of plan where everyone will be happy with what is going on in their downtown area. Um, one of the the most, we had a great graduation ceremony. Uh, yes, we did. And we, the school system has done just a magnificent job of yes. adjusting to uh, the shutdown of the physical buildings. Yes. One of the biggest challenges that the administrators faced was lack of broadband, lack of high quality, high speed, um, internet services. Yes. Do you have any any plans or ideas about improving technology in our community? Well, in regards to broadband, we've been having an issue across the rural Black Belt counties, and actually, that was one of the things that was on the table and on the list for the state of Alabama within that 1.9 billion dollars that they are trying to pass within the budget. So what I've been doing, <clears throat> I've been following the bill because if I'm following the bill, that means I'm following the money. I need to see how that money is allocated between the counties. So I've been following that bill. The state of Alabama has got to go back into special sessions before they can even make a decision on how it's gonna be allocated properly. And from that particular point, 
We need to work with our constituents and our representatives that we have that will advocate and lobby for us down at the state house about the needs of Macon County, broadband being one of them. If we don't have a voice or somebody to submit something to the state or the legislator when they go back and after this special session, then we probably lose out on funding for a lot of things, including broadband. Do I understand correctly, and I've got to admit that I learned this just recently. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I, I learned from a reputable source recently that the whole broadband issue, unfortunately, is also a I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're breaking up really bad. Okay, let me try again. Maybe I was actually too loud. Mm -hmm. Do I understand correctly that perhaps part of the entire broadband problem is at very least complicated by big money and large corporations involved in broadband so that they want to hold monopolies and at the same time they don't want to turn, they don't want to invest the money in certain areas, but they also won't let go of their hold on certain areas to let other companies do it. So that we're, I mean, I think it was Representative Warren who commented lately that it's like there's this chokehold that they're trying to fight. Mm -hmm. That that would be a correct uh, statement. And that is one of the reasons why they are having to have a special session uh -huh. coming up here. So that would be okay. an adequate statement that she uh, that she gave to you. Okay, now we have a question coming in on chat. Okay. From one of our members. She okay. said, she said, actually, does she have experience in proposal writing? I have experience in proposal writing. Yes, I do. And I, I, I write documentation for corporate all the time, whether it's proposals, whether it's work instructions, whether it's procedures or contracts. Also, my first degree is in legal studies, paralegal studies. I always have to do research and write proposals in different documentation like that as well. Are you familiar with the current Tuskegee City budget and would you allocate funds differently? And if you would allocate differently, what would your priorities be? I am familiar with the budget. <clears throat> I have been tracking the budget for a couple years now. I have prepared notes and documentation and action items to the city in some of my presentations at the work session a couple of times in regards to the budget. I've offered uh, uh, suggestions on how we could allocate funds and how we should forecast our budget out for five years being that we are a small community and we don't have a whole lot of revenue coming in so the smartest thing to do would be to forecast for five years i've offered that suggestion as well um i've given them a packet with critical internal issues and to look at if we had to do attrition and what would be the best place to do cuts or what would be the best place to make savings um, and where we need to allocate more funding. I think our sanitation workers and public works department needs more um, funding because we don't have a lot of resources in that particular area and we are asking them to do a, a whole lot outside of picking up the garbage we also are asking them to clean the streets, cut the grass, but it's only about seven of them that, that's working. And that is one of the reasons why I advocate for the people in the community to help our public works department, because there's not a whole lot of them with the amount of work that they have to do. So I would most definitely make sure that we uh, fund the proper as public works in the sanitation and streets department. That's do one you, of the places we need to look at. Do you remember what that line item, do you remember what, there. Do you remember what that line item is for public works now and what would you increase it to? I don't know right off the back of my 
um, head what that line item would, would be. I don't know the number right off for the 2019 budget because that budget had been amended. So I don't have the final approved budget. Personally. What, what's your plan for blight? How do you plan to eradicate the rundown properties in town? Or? Blight is another issue that we have. Um, we have a lot of abandoned houses and we have a lot of dilapidated buildings. And we need to look at how we can get those buildings back into a productive use. We need to look at ordinance that may be available out there and we're not enforcing the codes on those things with the property owners in order for them to have their properties back in productive use. We need to look at what that, uh, that may be. Also, we need to look at if we have come to the end of our road and we've done everything that we need to do, what demolition looks like. Because demolition is a high cost on the city, so we need to try every avenue that we can before we start just demolishing and knocking down buildings. Because depending on the budget, and I'm not entirely sure what their financial situation may be right now, it may not be cost effective or um, the city may not be able to afford to knock them down. So we need to look at different ways of getting those buildings back into productive use in those homes as well. Well, those of us who live in these historic homes know many of the, the deficiencies uh, in terms of insulation and Mm -hmm. uh, it's just expensive to maintain old homes. Mm -hmm. So bringing them back into commerce would have to be expensive too, just like demolition is expensive. Mm -hmm. How do you accomplish that? How do you? Well, if it is a historical piece of property, there may be the opportunity for grants for historical pieces of property. But we have to explore grants. Also, we have to explore or just other properties that are in the area, we have to look at maybe creating some type of housing program on the city side to see how that works. But that is a more detailed and in-depth type of situation, and it may cause um, for legislative action. Because we, hit, we live in Alabama, and Alabama has the longest amendment <laughs> and to the constitution, they have like over 900 amendments to their constitution. And when you wanna make drastic changes as far as economic development is concerned for your community in the state of Alabama, it may cause for some type of legislative action, especially if we're talking about uh, something that is not particularly on the books that we could do outside of enforcing ordinance and putting liens on properties and things like that. So we will have to see what that looks like and see can we bypass that or that's or is that something that we have to do as far as taking it down to the state house. Uh, we have another question that has come in. What is what is your ongoing experience with city government? Um, not just your observations. Well mainly it has been observation in working with the local government that we have now and meeting with them and giving them ideas on and sharing ideas and issues and critical issues that we have in place right now and offer them, offering them suggestions on what they could do to go forward. It's not necessarily a plan that is set in stone, but it's a direction that they could have gone through as far as organizational structure. You know, you have to make sure you have proper organizational structures and making sure that your departments are um, funded properly and properly staffed. So I've also worked with them and um, given them examples of those types of things. I've given them budget uh, advice. I've combed through their personal audit documentation and have given my advice on uh, what they need to do and the things that they need to address as far as corrective actions if, if uh, we're concerned in regards to their internal audit that they have because I do have a background in, in, in internal auditing. So I've offered that suggestion to them as well. And I've, I've met with every city manager that we have uh, there except for the one we have now 
to try to see what we can do and how I could be of help and offer my services to them, including writing documentation and giving it to them free of charge over these past three years, three or four years. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the low hanging fruit, if you became mayor, what would you do in the first 90 days? First 90 days. <clears throat> First 90 days, I would actually have to look at our departments to see how they are properly staffed to be able to provide services to the community. Because right now, one of the issues that we have is getting our streets clean, making sure the grass is cut, making sure the trash is picked up on time, but we don't have enough people in our sanitation department. They don't have enough help. They, they are underpaid. Uh, they have issues there. We need to look at the budget to see how can we get them properly staffed so they can be able to do what they need to do for the community as a whole. We need to also look at public safety. Public safety is another issue because I myself have experienced that I can't even sit in my own living room without hearing gunshots. And that's in the house. So we have a problem with that. And when we look at public safety, here again, they're understaffed. And for the ones that are there, we have a few, a few of them, they're not residents of the area. So we need to look at that department. We need to also look at parts of beautification when it comes to our signage. I've heard and also witnessed myself that some of our law enforcement they don't even know what street to go down when they get a call because they cannot even recognize the street. So something as simple as getting new signage so they can know where to go, have directions of how they're supposed to get there. So those are some things that we kind of want to look for and look at and see what can we do in regards to helping our public works department and our public safety department as well. And getting some, just some, just some signs so people can know where they are, where they're going, <laughs> just to have some direction because right now there is none. One of the problems we have is, have had over the last few decades is population loss and it's frequently blamed on high utility cost. Mm -hmm. Again, citing our own personal experiences as mm -hmm. homeowners who live in historic homes, mm -hmm. we know that there is energy inefficiency. Mm -hmm. Would you use your influence as mayor to perhaps get UBT to reinstate the audit program that they had, which identifies uh, inefficiencies in homes? And then uh, would you go a step further to help homeowners to get financing to make corrections and improvements to, to uh, improve the efficiencies of their homes? Absolutely, because that is one of the things that people talk about all the time, whether they live here uh, or whether they want to come back here. And the first thing that they say is, the light bills are too high. I can't come back here. But I will work with UBT to look at their audit program, um, see what, what can we do in regards to weatherization and if they're willing to uh, put those things out there and do them. We can also look at programs that the state provides because the state have programs as well for weatherization. Some of the issues uh, when it comes to the rural area, when it comes to the weatherization program is some of the homeowners are not homeowners, they're renters. And the property owners may not want to do the program. So they don't get the money for it in order to do that for the renter. So we have to figure out how we will be able to work that through so they can get funding to be able to do that and just look at some other opportunities that are out there uh, to get these home weather weatherized. Because here again, there are a lot of older homes in this community and we all have the same problem with the, with the light bills because the homes are so old. And another issue that we have in the rural community, most rural communities, have high light bills because of the population and because of the business industry that's in that area. 
and they have to figure out how to spread the utilities across everybody to stay afloat. So we have to work together and, and, and be real creative on how we can get these light bills to come down.